All right, hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy. I'm here with Coach Matt and Rick David. Uh, today we're going to jump right into it with some high tempo. Um, want to go ahead, Matt, you want to kick it off? What do you have this week? The song Cleveland, they had a big 76ers promotion where they're trying to recruit LeBron James to complete the process for the Sixers. I guess he can opt out of his contract if he wants to at the end of this season. So they're trying to recruit him to uh, complete the process. Sign Philly and bring that basketball championship to him. Don't know how about that. I don't know if you have to have LeBron come in for them to field a competitive team. But I saw it and thought it was interesting. Yeah, just Matt, you might have cut out there a little bit, but just to recap, he brought up that uh, some people, I think they bought billboards is what they did, trying to lure LeBron to Philadelphia. I can't remember what they said. It was yep. something like uh, uh, something they're trying to get him because they think with a young core, he can come in and win right away. The Sixers are what? They're in close to the playoffs if they're not in the eighth spot. So it would make sense. Uh, he pushed everyone out, it seemed, right before the trade deadline. So why not? I mean, what's the point if he moves out completely out west? And I think he even came out, they talked about uh, reshuffling around, and I can use this for mine. Uh, Adam Silver came out, and he discussed moving the playoffs from an east-west to sort of a top-to-bottom best of all. And LeBron came out right against it immediately, saying that let's not get too crazy, I think was his quote. Uh, because, yeah, you don't want to. Whenever you're getting old, you don't want to be having a bad season. I mean, they would not They would be middle of the pack, so they would have a hell of a time in a top-to-bottom playoffs where in the East, you don't have that. So why would he want that? And that's why I don't see him going West. And in that scenario, uh, he stays East, and why wouldn't he end up with Philadelphia? But um, uh, I'll go ahead, Rick. We'll see what you got, and then we're going to get into uh, – Got some big stuff for the Pittsburgh area this week. Uh, what do you got, Rick? Uh, mine was the NHL trade deadline just passed, so we had some big names leave some different spots. So uh, we had Rick Nash go to Boston. We had Derek Broussard end up with the Penguins. Uh, Ryan McDonough went to Tampa Bay. So we have a lot of those guys moving around. Some guys stayed put. Eric Carlson didn't move from Ottawa. A lot of people had him gone to everywhere under the sun, but he stayed. So a lot of teams improving themselves. I think the Penguins definitely improved themselves by getting Burchard. They needed extra help on the wings to score. They also got Hornquist locked up here now in a long-term deal with five years, roughly about 5.3 a year when you figure it all out, the math. But uh, So we'll wait and see. I mean, the one thing that I will say, the hidden trade that I don't think anybody's really talked about, Paul Snazny, who's a face-off winner, who's uh, done, had a good season with – St. Louis. Now he's in Winnipeg, so Winnipeg put together a half decent trade to get him. I think that's going to be like the unsung trade. I think that guy will definitely improve that Winnipeg team. All right. Um, going to get into the Steel City updates. We'll stick with the NHL first. Hit up the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. I mean, I, I don't know, Rick, what do you think of the trades? Like, do you think anything substantial? I think they're still sitting good. Um, just reviewing it myself. Uh, still seven and two in the last ten. They slipped a spot, so they're now third in the Metropolitan Division. But I, I mean, at this point, I would be highly surprised if they didn't make the playoffs. So I think it's just shuffling some pieces around and trying to get ready for a run. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? I, I agree with you. Philadelphia has been on a great streak. They're on a six-game winning streak right now. So the other thing is, it seemed like. Every team just added one piece to the puzzle. Penguins added Burchard, Nash to Boston, McDonough to, you know, everybody was adding like one piece. It wasn't so much adding two, three, four pieces. It was adding like one piece. Every team was adding one piece. So I don't think anybody made a huge jump or anything really to super improve themselves. I think they just slightly improved themselves, everybody. I think everybody was worried about the cap. Everybody was worried about long-term contracts. McDonough, they're stuck with Tampa. They're stuck in a three- or four-year deal still left with him. So, I mean, I think they're still in. Columbus is your last at 69 points. Penguins are at 76. But Tampa Bay is already at 89. I think Tampa Bay's now got a good chunk. They're probably going to take that top spot. But I think Penguins are still in. They still got a good team. 
Murray's back to injured again. The Smith is back up to be the starter tonight in a 2-2 game right now with the Devils. So, I mean, that's where my main concern is. Is Murray going to be healthy to make this run? So hopefully he'll come back here soon, maybe be out a couple games. So, Yeah, I looked through the schedules, and I, I really the Lightning are so far ahead at this point that I really don't see them making that push for one. And I would assume the Maple Leafs and Bruins both aren't going to melt down. So I think realistically, looking at the Penguins, they're going to land anywhere from three to seven. I don't think they'll hit the eight seed. I I mean, it's really tight in the middle here. You're going to have either the Maple Leafs or Bruins. I assume one of them are going to hit a dry spell. Uh, you'll have battling with the Panthers then. Or no, the Panthers are already out. So the Flyers, Caps, Devils, and Blue Jackets. And then you have teams like the... The Panthers are the next in line from the East and the uh, Islanders in the Metropolitan, but really I don't see the Penguins having to battle with them. It's going to be with the Flyers, Caps, possibly the Devils. Hopefully they can pull the one out tonight. And a little bit of Bruins, Maple Leafs. And is there really going to be a difference in that first round playoff? I don't I don't think so. I think it's going to be one of them teams. But, you know, I think here's it's the be other a tough round. Go ahead, Matt. Here's the other piece to this too. Even the like the Penguins pulled that trade off, but also they added by subtracting Reeves. He really hasn't contributed a whole lot points wise. They brought him in to be the brawler. They really weren't giving him a lot of minutes. And so I think that that's going to benefit the Penguins in the long run because just not having him on the roster and having someone that can maybe contribute to scoring some points is going to show a lot more come playoff time, I think, than, than keeping Reeves on the active roster. Yeah, I agree with the point you made about uh, scoring. If Murray is injured and, I mean, he's not 100% for the playoffs, they're going to need to score some points because you're going to get into some high-scoring matchups, which seem to be the trend whenever he's out. Uh, I'm not saying you can't make a run like that. It's just highly unlikely. But worst case scenario, uh, he's he's out a couple games in the playoffs, and we'll get to see some exciting high scoring games. Um, anything else you guys want to add on the Penguins? No. Nope. All right. Uh, moving on to the Pirates, and I'm not going to stay long on the Pirates um, because we're going to get back into uh, their unfortunate news here in a second. Uh, spring training has started in Grapefruit League. Pirates are dead last. 0-3 in the Grapefruit League. I <laughs> they're gonna, their diff goal or their run differential is negative 17. Negative 17. This isn't like when the Penguins got down and they were down or something similar like 20 games in. This is three games they're getting outscored by a 17 runs. Embarrassing. I saw a couple players rallying around saying that, um, uh, what was it, one of the Rays guys, he ended up getting traded to the Pirates, and he was excited about it because he thought he was going to be demoted, and he'd rather play with the Pirates than in the minor leagues. Well, no shit. But, I mean, you, you're picking the Pirates over the minor leagues. That's how low the Pirates have fallen. And uh, we'll say I'll save my rant for them uh, for a second. Steelers front. I haven't heard much. It's been quiet, a little too quiet, because you're getting ready for the draft. I don't know what direction they're really going to move in. I, I I really hope that they try to get just some help on either side of the line, some offensive line help or some defensive line help. You really can't expect Ben Roethlisberger to keep getting hit like he has been the past two years at his age. And, and and hold up for a whole season. But it's been quiet out of there, uh, so I don't really have much on them either, but that's going to be coming up. That's going to be the storyline uh, over the next month or so. They're going to start doing uh, player combines, and we'll get some ratings and see who's projected to fall to the Steelers. Anything else you guys want to add uh, about Pittsburgh? Uh, the game today they tied in, and I mean, they didn't send much to go play in Orlando, Florida against the Braves. I mean, this was their starting lineup today. Frazier, Moran, Luplo, Brents, Kramer, Wood, Todd Cunningham, 
Max Mordoff and Jacob Stallings. That looks like mostly those about six of those guys will be reporting to Indianapolis to start the year. So they didn't send a lot. So a lot of these teams, I mean, Atlanta didn't send a lot either. They sent about three guys that are going to be stars too. So a lot of other teams are playing more major leaguers. Pirates are not. So I don't know what the thinking is, but whatever. We'll see what happens. Well, well, they say that they're going to build the farm team, and then they don't mm-hmm. even try. You have a team like the Yankees who are 5-0. and They're playing guys like Russell Wilson, uh, the starting quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. I really don't see how that helps them. But the Pirates can't send anybody. It's just frustrating. Uh, There's no other words around it. Uh, Also in a negative light since we're on spring training, uh, my my man Tim Tebow, he went down. Tripped on a (laughs) sprinkler? Is Is that what happened, Rick? That is a true story. Tripped on a sprinkler and injured. They didn't want to report it at first. They wanted to report his sprained ankle. And then some reporter got a hold of it and said, no, he tripped over a sprinkler. So, but, I mean, these are just stupid injuries of spring training. I mean, Elvis Andrus got hurt taking a, a ground ball, just moved, and now he's injured. I mean, some of these weird injuries of spring training are just absolutely hilarious in a way. So, but so you're saying Tim Tebow can't walk on water is what you're saying. <laughs> well, no, Matt. He's expected to walk on water, but whenever little metal pulls, they, I think they called it a sprinkler malfunction. He, he saw the water. He thought, safe to travel here. And and what happened? A little sprinkler shot up and got him right in the leg. <laughs> sort of like Achilles. I'd assume it's a similar injury to him. Some people just get hit in that weak spot, and then they go down. But I did hear he was, he was uh, slighted to be looked at as a legit threat. I've seen multiple Mets people say that he might make the majors this year. And I just think to myself, are the Mets that bad? Are they hurting that bad for season ticket holders that they're going to promote Tim Tebow once again? Because last year they were like, there's no way. And that I thought that was a clear chance the way they ended the season. But I, I don't know. Hey, I just wish. I mean, bring him to the Pirates. Get some excitement. That's a move. Would you be surprised if they brought Tim Tebow into Pittsburgh? It would be for selling tickets. That's what they would do. But, I mean, <laughs> do you really promote a guy who was hitting 220 and low A ball to high A ball to hit 231? I mean, it was it was all a money move. The Mets own the high A team, which is in Port St. Lucie. You bring them in, you make money. It was better than keeping them in the Savannah Sand Nats or whatever they're called nowadays. No, Cl- Columbia Fireflies. That's what they're yeah, calling themselves the fireflies, nowadays. Yeah. The Fireflies. They brought him there to just to sell tickets. Do you think he's really going to go to Binghamton where they average about 1,500 fans a game or 1,800 a game? No. I mean, this guy's going to end here soon. I mean, he's taking roster spot away from a 18-year-old out of college, and like a uh, high school or a 20-year-old out of college. It, it's all about selling tickets. What level did Michael Jordan Ticket. make? Double A, Binghamton. He made uh, Birmingham, Barons. So double A. Birmingham. Tim Tebow is 1A away from being equal yeah. to Michael Jordan. Yeah, but Michael Jordan didn't even start most nights. He was a backup or something else. I'll give you a trivia question. Who the heck was his manager? It was a famous manager. Was his manager in double A? Pete Rose. No. Terry Francona. Terry, Terry Francona. Francona. Gary Francona was his manager in Double A, Burn, in in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. That's a cool trivia fact. I would never have guessed that. Hmm? All right. Um. Well, let's stay with MLB. Uh, the Major League Baseball Players Association uh, received a grievance. We talked about this before when it first came out. It was first rumored, and the Pirates brass shot it down. Said, Ah, no, that's just a rumor. No big deal. But they officially filed a grievance against four teams. I think originally it was considered to just be the Marlins and the Pirates, but this one includes the Rays and the Athletics, which the Athletics, to me, is the funniest of all teams in this. Marlins, they're notorious. Everyone knows they're cheapskates. They go ahead and they have this thing where they have, they put together a team every, what, decade or so? every eight years, and they try to make a run. And then they trade everyone off. And it's worked twice. Did they they win two World Series or just one? Two. 
said they won two, so it's worked twice. A lot of times their runs really don't make it anywhere, even into the playoffs. Maybe a couple wild cards. Uh, so they're expected, like the Pirates, they don't even try at all. But the Athletics, Moneyball, they made a movie about how they don't like to spend money and how they could lowball and just pick these random Joes, uh, the Tim Tebows of the world, you could say, the, these minor league heroes, and they could bring them into Major League Baseball. And if they all hit for average, they could go ahead and make a run. And they've never had the success that the Marlins have had. And now the Players Association, it's, it's kind of been a bad year. I, I looked through some of the free agents. Why would you bid and pay a guy? I, or these are guaranteed salaries. It's not like the NFL where you can sign a guy and realize, bad move, I'm going to cut him. Because a lot of people don't realize in Major League Baseball, when you sign these, like Scott Boris, he's going to get his guys guaranteed contracts. So if they don't play, you're screwed. Now, luckily, there's no salary cap. So if you're a team like the Yankees, you can just keep throwing big salaries out. And if you have a bad guy, just don't play him. No big deal. You can cut him, whatever, just eat the salary. But for these these clubs that consider themselves a small market like the Pirates, you make one or two mistakes and you're still trying to, um, I don't know, swindle your fans out of extra money, you're, you're kind of stuck. There's nothing you can do. And that's why... I know Matt's a fan of St. Louis. Uh, they're a good organization to look at the way they handle money. Do they extend offers to vets? Yes, yeah, sometimes they do. They brought in Lance Berkman that one year. Uh, went after him after he was with the Astros. Uh, they bring in some other guys. Uh, they, they trade around some pitching arms and stuff. They really make moves that I wouldn't say they're, they're extremely risky, but they take chances and try to win. And these teams on this list, the four teams that the Players Association is coming after, they don't do that. Oakland Athletics, they wrote a book and everything about how they don't take risks. They just go ahead and try to pick up the best of the the, uh, Class B athletes that are out there. Tampa Bay, I don't know what they were doing. They kind of had their own Marlins situation where they had everyone uh, really good. They'd made their run. They didn't win at all. And then they kind of got rid of everybody. But they haven't really tried to build back up. So you're looking at these. I I really think the Players Association has a grievance. They have a gripe. They might win this. Uh, I'm looking through it. I I already looked at it previously. I know they have a good case against the Pirates. And the Pirates, their defense came out today and they said that they invest not only in players, but they invest in the stadium experience and a couple other random things like building the farm team and how they're they're trying to build training facilities is where they said the money was going to for overseas facilities. So that's pretty much the whole scenario wrapping up. So I want to get you guys' thoughts. Do you think well first off, we'll go what do you think about the grievance itself before I get into some hypotheticals? Uh, Matt, you have any thoughts as I started talking about the cards there? One of the things that I looked at with this is if you're the owner of one of these franchises, why? I mean, I don't I don't think that you necessarily have to force them to field a competitive team, especially if you have a market like the Pirates where people are going to go. It doesn't matter how crappy of a team they are. People are going to go to the games, and they're going to complain about how bad the team is, and the only way that you make it stop is you don't go or you follow another team. You know, you take advantage of that. And I don't I don't foresee them doing that. And even if they did and you said, well, you have to spend money. So you're going to force them to spend money on a crappy player that doesn't help them. That doesn't that's not going to make their team any more competitive. You know, I, I think you look at this and with St. Louis, the, the thing that I liked with them is that they made competitive offers to their players. When Pujols hit free agency, they ma- they put in a legitimate offer. And it just happened that Anaheim broke the bank to, you know, you don't want to completely screw your team over by offering, especially for a small market team where you you overextend on a player that, you know, could be one of your franchise players 
that then you have no money or no assets to provide for the rest of your team. So you have one player. If he stubs his toe or trips over a sprinkler, and now you <laughs> own three hundred million dollars, like that's a ridiculous amount of money to be paying someone to sit on the bench. I'd be furious if I pay spent that money on a player that didn't play. That's a good point. Think about it too. So you know, I, I guess that's where I'm looking at a lot of this is that. Well, to your point, when the Yankees brought in A-Rod, he failed a drug mm-hmm. test. They still had to pay him, mm-hmm. and they're kind of screwed there. And a lot of uh, people laugh it off, and they're like, oh, A-Rod, <laughs> we can't wait till you're in the Hall of Fame. But realistically, that's the worst-case scenario. It might not be something like a sprinkler trip, but, I mean, there are real, real risks. Because some of your big-name free agents for over the past decade or so, most of them had some type of steroid allocation. Any one of those, uh, Ryan Braun, A Rod, who else? I mean, not not bringing out the obvious like ones that testified, like Clemens and those. But you have guys. You have to be weary about them getting that big time contract because at any time they could be suspended for steroids, and I th- still think that's a risk. Uh, so those are some good points, Rick. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. I was looking over the salaries right now for the every teams, kind of starting today according to Sports Tracks. Pirates are 26, but you 27's Tampa, Miami's 24, and Oakland's 29. So they didn't even hit the bottom four. They went out and grabbed four. And you wouldn't believe this, but the lowest team in the league actually shocked me. It's actually the Philadelphia Phillies are 44 million. And then you look at Marlins. They're still paying Trust 82. the process, Rick. It's a Philly okay. motto. But, but if you're going to blame teams for not – signing players or paying contracts, you should pick the bottom four, not the Marlins that are at 24. Yes, I believe the Marlins are, in fact, and they look, you picked the four obvious teams. You didn't pick the four right teams. I'll go with that with Tony Clark because Miami did dump money. Pirates did, but I I disagree and agree with some of the moves, and I'll, I'll, I have some stats to prove me later. Tampa Bay went on a fire sale. That That's obvious. Oakland didn't really sign anybody. They traded for Brandon Moss. That was about their big thing. But, I mean, why didn't you go? Padres were at 25. You didn't go after them because they signed Hosmer. So that would look bad on you. What did the White Sox do? They were sitting at 28. They didn't do really anything this offseason. But, again, they're a process team like the Phillies, like the Astros, that are doing the – we're going to sell everybody off, buy all these prospects. Philadelphia is in the spot to make. They're going to start theirs. Uh, White Sox are still about a year or two out. So, but I mean, I don't get it. But here's the other thing: you look at here, McCutcheon, fourteen million, Dickinson, three million. So realistically, it's a trade-off. So there's eleven million dollars you save. McCutcheon's numbers last year: two seventy nine, twenty eight home runs, eighty eight RBIs, on base percentage eight four uh, eight forty five. Dickinson, eight. 828 average, 27 home runs, only off by one. RBI is very different, 62. But here's Dickinson's credit. Given him second best left fielder in defensive matrix was Corey Dickinson. Would have never guessed that in my wildest dreams. And he was an all star and started in the all star game. So are you going to blame a team that made an $11, $11 million savings to get a guy who was an all star and second best left fielder in defense? I mean, it's tough to make that argument. Yes. If you had to tell me a running a video game, I would take Corey Dickinson because of that $11 million savings. Now, what I would have done is I would go out there in the free agent market because Pirates need a starting pitcher because they traded Garrett Colway when they didn't need to. They can now get co-get Jerry Garrietta. Jake Garrietta is still sitting there. I mean, you could realistically say, hey, one year, $10 million. Let's see what you do, buddy. And guess what? If he does half decent, the Pirates tank, congratulations, you're traded somewhere. We don't know where, but you're going to be traded. So, I mean, he gets the, he could be the ace, and he could start opening day. I mean, there, you could do different things like that and rebuild your farm system that way, trade him for about two or three prospects. So, I, I, I understand the grievance. I don't agree with your four teams, and I don't think teams should be faulted for spending their money smartly sometimes. Using that as an example. Well, Rick, that was a Yenzer speech if I ever heard one. And I just want to say that you're looking at this from a one-year 
view. Yeah, okay, you, you picked out a couple names, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm when I'm looking at the documents and I know they're not fully out yet, I think the MLB PA have been putting this together for at least five years mm -hmm. because that's about whenever the Rays had their run and that's when the Pirates had their run in the playoffs. And since that time and that time frame, they've pretty much both franchises has, have lost everyone. And in that same time frame, you saw the A's drop from Moneyball whenever they published all their stuff and they're bragging about how great they were. And everyone else went to that advanced analytics. And the athletics kind of just threw their hands up and were like, ah, well, they took our thing now. Uh, we, we made money from, from the movie or whatever they did. But now we can't get the guys in anymore. So we're just going to kind of throw wave the white flag. They haven't yeah. tried to sign anyone. Same with the Marlins. I mean, they've been trading guys over the past five years. Pirates. Every guy they get, they trade. And at some point, if you're a big-time guy and you want to retire or whatever, you look at McCutcheon, okay, maybe he wasn't the one that they're going to look at this year. But really, why would you trade Cole? Because that's where they're going to have the gripe. You might be able to say, okay, well, we can do the facts for this, but this isn't a one-time thing for the Pirates. This is an over, and, and it could even be greater. They could have greater evidence because it's written about multiple times ever since the Barry Bond thing in the 1990s. It doesn't matter who the owner is. Whoever comes into Pittsburgh, they must sign a backdoor deal with other owners that they're going to be a glorified minor league um, farm system or major league farm system for some of these other teams. Uh, where you see with the Phillies, they've actually they've been tanking. Yeah, they're, they're dead last this year. They might have been dead last last year too but they were they're in the middle of a process and you're going to see them they're they're going all in like the astros and i think that's why they didn't single them out it's only been two or three years of their rebuild for them they haven't really reached that five-year window that i think these other teams are about because it was what 2013 for the pirates so this is the fifth year so had I'll say this also for a team like the Phillies that they won the World Series in 2008. So, I mean, within relative recent memory, they've put together a championship caliber franchise. The, the best that the Pirates do is they win their one. They get to October and then they lose in the first round of the, the play in. So there's a team and putting together a team for a playoff run. Yeah. I think when you look at that standard and you look at these teams that, that the players associations trying to signal out, there are, there are teams that are clearly not in it for winning. They're not trying to put together someone competitive or even have any kind of direction. Cause I, I think people could, would even be on board with the pirates tanking if that's what they were doing to get themselves in a position to be competitive. But they move just enough pieces around, like you've said before. They move just enough pieces so that it gives the illusion that they're competitive. And then by the time that they're actually ready to compete, either the players are too old, too injured, or they don't have the right combination of pieces to put together a decent run. Yeah, and that Phillies team, they had Ryan Howard and who else? Chase Utley. Um, Jimmy Rollins. Jimmy Rollins. So you can name players on their team. You can name a handful of guys that they've signed over the past 20 years. Can you do that for the Pirates? Like, realistically, could you name five big-name guys that they kept around? No. I mean, it's, like, you can sit there and it's just like, wow, I, I didn't think about it like that because these other teams, they all have big-name studs, and we looked at it when the Hall of Fame thing came out. Do, do they have anyone of that caliber ever – and do they keep them around? No. And that's where you might make the uh, the wins above replacement thing against McCutcheon and why that trade was worth it. But in the grand scheme of things, no, that trade's not worth it. Because it would have been much more meaningful to Pirates fans if they were able to keep McCutcheon and instead went all in, signed him, and made a push for him to be Hall of Fame and kind of made him a chance to be face of the franchise. Because right now, you're looking at, I mean, it's basically a team of vagabonds right now. There's no excitement here. And that's what the MLB uh, Players Association has to be licking their chops. Because they could just ask that argument. Like, Pirates, who's your big name guy? Who's the face of your franchise over the past 
the past 15 years. Who are they going to say? McCutcheon? Because they're like, oh, wait, didn't you, didn't you just trade him? And then what's the Pirates' rebuttal? But I will say this. McCutcheon's a fading memory. He was... And he was your third worst. Or he was your third. He was your last guy for your defensive saber metrics for your outfielders. And I mean, Josh Bell is sitting right there. That's your future of the Pirates. I mean, and and here's the other thing too. Cincinnati has been on a rebuild. They haven't shown much. Pirates beat them in the playoffs, and they have been tanking. But here's the thing: they sit at 22 with 89 million. So Pirates are at 77. They're at 89. I but think they have a curse, the, though. They have the the Pete Rose curse. Yeah, where, but think where about guys this. Guys don't though. hustle enough in the playoffs. But you look at this though. Joey Votto's getting twenty five with a trade clause. He can't be traded anywhere. <laughs> he has a no trade clause. Homer Bailey has a twenty one million with a no trade clause. Devin Mesoraco has like a partial no trade clause. That's thirteen million. So between three guys, that's sixty million of your eighty nine is tied up in three guys who you're stuck with. So, I mean, the Reds haven't proved much. Pirates have been better than the Reds. And here's another team that tanked everybody. The Braves. When were the Braves good? <laughs> Cincinnati won in 1990. I can remember that. And what was Braves, 95 or 96? Braves just had like three guys. Like half the Hall of Fame class was Braves. Yeah, but look, that was then. This is now. I mean, I mean, look at this. Freddie Freeman's getting 21. Scott Kazmer's on a one-year $17 million. Brandon McCarty's $11 million. So if they didn't take that trade with the Dodgers, pretty much where the Dodgers money dumped guys on them so they could send Kemp there on a quicker money dump. I mean, look at that right there. 21, 17, and 11, 28, 21. That's what, $50 million right there? Tied up in three guys. And Nick Morcakis, who I don't know why he still has a major league contract, is 11. He's at six, So that puts him at 66 of their 109 is tied up in four players who they're kind of stuck with because who wants to trade those contracts? Well, I'll say this. Well, Freeman's one worth it. The other three are, uh, they're on their last legs and they might as well start, you know, start giving their waves by to the fans. Since, well, I can sit and think, and I know the Braves have signed big free agents. Like they signed Teixeira probably a decade or so ago. They made moves to get him. 2002. And then they eventually traded him to the Yankees. I can't do that for the other teams on no, this list. Four. So um, if you're looking at the, the Marlins, the Rays, uh, who was the other one? Athletics and the Pirates. Have they signed a guy of that caliber? I know that's cherry picking, but that might be something that the MLBPA is going to look at. Like, okay, they signed to share to an awful deal. They also signed a pitcher too. Who was at that one year? And they signed Bartolo Colon, too. Like, they signed, like, big-name guys for no reason and garbage contracts, the Braves. But you also got to look at their TV contracts, too. The, those are your four worst teams in TV contracts, or at least in your bottom six in TV contracts. I mean, look at the other ones. I mean, Braves have a huge – they have a huge TV contract. I mean, the Reds are what – whatever that Kentucky FSN area is. I mean, these are your four worst TV contracts right here. I mean, that's why you don't see spring training games of these teams. They don't have them because their TV deals aren't signing them. at and is going to play Penguin games. Tampa Bay is not – they're showing Yankee games down there on it. Over, They're showing Yankee games over Tampa Bay, in Tampa Bay even. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Oakland will go take a San Francisco game before an Oakland game. I mean, I mean these teams are bad contracts. But here's another one too, Miss. You were saying about the Reds. The Reds – in in 2010 and 2012 won the NL Central. The Pirates can't even be com- like they can't even win their own division. They they have to back into the playoffs as a wild card team. You know, I think those are some of the things that they're probably looking at too is that put yourself in a position maybe not even in the in the the entire for the pennant race, but at least win your damn conference, win your division. Be competitive within the the four or five teams in the in your own area. And they can't even do that. Yeah, didn't the Reds also give Adam Dunn an outrageous contract? Yes. So, yes. like, they've been known to try to spend. That's what I'm saying. I can cherry pick at least one big name that these other teams have signed. And I can't do this for these other teams. I know. And th- th- maybe I don't even think the Pirates would have gotten this if they signed Neil Walker. I think that's the one case where they can point at and say, 
what, why didn't you sign him? You just got off the playoff run and instead you pushed him out. And that doesn't make any sense to anyone else because you can't say, uh, well, we needed to cut money because we didn't make the playoffs. No, you did. You got the extra playoff money. Like, why couldn't you have signed him? I, I can't speak for the Marlins and the Rays and the Athletics because I don't follow them uh, as closely. But when I'm looking at it, that's what I think. I think the Marlins are kind of in a similar situation, although the Jose Fernandez death, I think, kind of hurts them, and it's not really their fault because that's a big-name guy that they might have had a chance to keep around just because of the influence he had in the area um, and his Hispanic roots where he's going to be able to bring in some of that Miami crowd where now they really don't have a chance to to sign and keep someone uh, where – in 2002, like when they jettisoned that, was at the Moises Alou team, LeVon Hernandez, whatever year that was. Like they got rid of all of those guys. I think they learned from that mistake. And I, I could have seen them, I could have saw them signing Jose Fernandez to a longer deal, but we'll never know. So really, they don't have anyone else to, to point to. The Pirates, though, they have a hard case against them with Neil Walker. And now, like the Garrett Cole thing, you're just looking at additional evidence that they can point to. And I, but you, I don't even know what what comes of this, Rick. Like, what happens if, like, they're found guilty? Well, the arbitrators are going to have to decide and figure out who's who's to blame here. But I think what the teams are going to do is say, we're not getting a lot of money from our TV deals. We're not doing much. We're we're second class in a way because these teams like Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco uh, are all getting huge massive deals from their you know their tv products we're not we're trying to compete with this system you know so i think that's going to be one thing and you can keep saying neil walker but i'm going to tell you you could have resigned him but look at him right now he's out of baseball he's done right now i mean three what two years later he's out of baseball then say, sign him. nobody wants him you could say the he, pirates be, are out of baseball too right now though rick you could say that, but I'm still picking on the be fourth in the division. It could be like because the- I don't see where the Reds got better. How are the Reds better? <laughs> name a guy in the ro- name a guy in their rotation that's going to win ten games. I would love to know. You got to spend money to make money, Rick. You got to spend money well, to make money. Rick, it could be like well, a bad marriage when, when the divorce happens. Both people fall apart. Pirates and Neil Walker, they fell apart there. It was bad for both sides. Now they're living outside of a food lion, asking for handouts. He's going to resign and he's going to turn his career around. Disney's going to make a movie about it. Yeah. He'll be turning his career around. There's some opportunities. The Long Island Ducks and Independent League need a, need a couple infielders. I mean, he could go there. Maybe Korea. Maybe even Mexico. I mean, but I don't see it happening. He, what where are we at today? Whatever it is. The 27th game, spring training games have started and he's sitting at home. I mean, that's how bad it is. So, And he was demanding a four-year contract. Yeah. He can keep waiting for that. It ain't gonna Ricky, happen. You would have just said Tim Tebow and Russell Wilson are both on rosters, and he's at home. And Russell Wilson's an ambassador. He's going to be cut here in a couple of days. So Tim Tebow's all a publicity stunt to sell tickets in Port St. Lucie because nobody goes to those spring training games. And Mets need money. See, there you proved the sto- You proved me right. Mets need money. How do you make money? <laughs> you have a circus freak show who hits two sixteen and single A ball to go sell tickets so you can generate to make money in spring training. Wait, I Rick, mean, I have the best idea. And it's single- if the pirates need to make money, they should bring back Barry Bonds. He said that he he's wanted to play. Now, granted, they don't have the DH, but bring him back. He still has it. I've heard. I would, I would love, I would drive up there to see him. His Man. outfield matrix is worse than McCutcheon's. I want to, <laughs> I want to play him. Where would you play him? Rick first base or pitcher. DH. Are- our pitchers are so bad that they're giving base. up home runs anyway. Barry Bonds is not the Josh Bell, home. your franchise player, <laughs> Josh Bell. Weren't they shipping him first. around too? What? Weren't they shipping Bell around too? Or no, that's Harrison. Harrison. Like, yeah, Harrison. But they'll keep be. him because he's too versatile and he's an all star and he can play three positions. I don't know. So. That's my final thoughts. Bring back Barry Bonds and then you'll have money to bring back other guys. If you want an ambassador, that's an ambassador. <laughs> I'd buy his jersey. Him or Tebow. Bring either one in. I'll buy that jersey. I'll wear it on the show for a month straight. 
You heard it here first. But uh, talking of money, let's get into, oh, man, the NCAA. I just have it on the topic is NCAA corruption. And I'm going to kind of go a couple of different routes. This is mainly about the basketball, but I wanted to start out, kind of break that depressing money talk about at Major League Baseball with, uh, hey, Matt, did you see uh, the uh, Jimbo Fisher defensive back graphic he sent out? Was it today or yesterday? And uh, Jalen Ramsey came after him. Yeah. What do you think of that? Yes, he did. I loved it. I loved it. Actually, the the comment that I saw the that I liked the best was uh, the the seventy five million dollar one of former players and coaches because the the contract that he signed at A and M he only got that money by going to Florida State first. So. I didn't see that. I thought that that was that was the the so effect wait, of that. He put out a graphic someone's, about I the coaching who, salaries. No, 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 no. Oh. He put it out about the players, but someone said, "Well, maybe they should just put one for the seventy-five million that he signed after leaving Florida State." But Ramsey was right. Jimbo didn't recruit him. He came to Florida State because of Jeremy Pruitt when he was there. So even though the the head coach taking the credit for it, he really didn't have a whole lot to do with his progression, development, etc. I just thought it was funny, and it reminded me of everything that's wrong with the NCAA right now. Coaches can leave, create fake graphics, and I, I'm going to throw stones a little bit, but um, I really I think Harbaugh started this to be honest. So it could come back at me whenever he came in. He had a big graphic that I saw some players were like, hey, we don't want you using it to promote Michigan, whatever. Same type of deal. Whenever he came back, he had like a ridiculous graphic, like 90-something percent of the players he signed in recruiting classes or gave scholarships to, he went to the NFL. And I've seen a couple of these floating around, and that's where you kind of see it hit again, where um, Fisher is using players that he had at a totally different program and their likeness to kind of go ahead and show and get players to come to Texas A&M. Is it wrong? Yes. Is it against the NCAA rules? No. I mean, you really shouldn't be able to use anyone's likeness because I don't think, well, see, this is where it gets fishy. So even though I think the players, they signed an agreement with the NFL. So as long as Fisher paid the the photographer for that Jalen Ramsey photo, whoever took that photo, owns it in the eyes of the law, So as long as he paid that photographer, he's free to use it no matter what Ramsey says or not. Because I'm pretty sure Ramsey has to sign his rights away. If I recall correctly, those were NFL photos. So every player signs the contract, whatever, that says the NFL can sell all of their likeness. So really, Ramsey can complain on social media. And I saw some people were like, uh, it was actually Tim Brewster, the Golden Gopher, or the ex-Golden Gopher, um, say that he was the one that sent it out. And then he's like, I love you, Ramsey was like his tweet back or something. And everyone was like, delete it. But he's not going to delete it because he doesn't have to. Ramsey has no course of action. And that's where you come down to this big NCAA lawsuit. So the FBI has been cracking in. And I'll be honest, some of these salaries that they were giving players and their families, they're so low that if I was if I was a family member, I'd be like, bro, what's lo- what's wrong with you? You only took two grand? What was the one for Penn State, Rick? I think it was two grand. It was something like that. It was like two or three. It wasn't much at all. How how hard up could you be that you get a two grand handshake and you you sign your life to be at the the cesspool that is Penn State basketball? Like I would be like, what? What are are you doing? Like I I can't get any better offers than I'm going to take a a two grand offer to play at Penn State who hasn't been – I mean, let's be honest. Have they been in the tournament more than one time in most of these players' lifetimes? Probably not because that 90 year was before a lot of them were born if they're 18 years old because they, they would have to have been born in 2000. I think they've only made it one time. I could be wrong. But I'll check it. Some of the other ones, uh, what was the one? So the big, the big name one, if you haven't been keeping up with this, it's the biggest news. Uh, actually... Yahoo.com has been leaking the documents every couple of days, and I love it. It's like a slow drip. They're like, oh, okay, here's a bunch of schools that we named. Oh, you don't believe us? Here's a, uh, a list of players and how much money they got. 
They didn't say it was all of the players. It was some. Because in that initial list, they didn't include the big Arizona guy. Then a couple of days later, they're like, oh, hey, uh, by the way, Sean Miller, you've been wiretapped. And we have you discussing $100,000 payments with so-and-so. And I have to believe that he's not the only coach that they have on wiretap. Um, so it's going to be interesting. They're doing it strategically right before the NCAA tournament. You know they are. So I'd like to get your guys' thoughts. I have some extra stuff, but I'll, I'll be throwing it in throughout. Uh, anything? We'll start with you again, Matt. What do you think? Do you think this is a big deal? Well, I think it's it's going to be a bigger deal. I think one of the things that, that is causing this to be a big deal is because the NCAA tried to handcuff the players with the one with the one year play one year and whatever to try to slow down the people jumping directly into the NBA. And I think that it's a terrible idea at this point. You know, I, I understand the logic behind it, but all they did was just dilute the process of getting students into their schools. You know, when you're looking at what's it going to take, you know, to take a player and I'll just use LeBron James as an example, even though he, he was able to jump directly from high school to the NBA Pick a, pick a college program that – what does he do to that college program by committing to their school for one year and making them a tournament-eligible team, a more competitive team? You know, I, I think he could, he could single-handedly carry a small college by himself. That, that's what a lot of these players are looking at. So you take someone – of that stature and now maybe if if you put him to put him through the ringer and say that he doesn't have the academics to qualify now you're trying to push <laughs> the financial end of that I, I mean a lot of it's speculative but that's that's what you're getting at is you're getting towards where these people were you know for one year you're trying to get a loaner so what do you do to get them to commit and, and I think that's where you're going to start to see. And, and I'm curious to see how deep it goes, because as you start going down this, don't be surprised if you see, you know, the, the, the same kind of academic scandals that are helping push these kids or guide them into these programs or funneling them in. It, it's going to be a lot deeper than just, oh, here's here's X amount of money. Come come play, because there has to be a lot higher things at risk for to go as high as the FBI sending out wiretaps and things like that. Rick, what are your thoughts? Uh, I pretty much uh, kind of agree. I mean, I think there's more to come. I don't think this is all of it. I think it's the, the thing that I will say is you have a lot of big powerhouse schools that are involved in this. Kentucky, Michigan State, Duke are all involved. Kansas is involved. I mean, the one story I read today, and I'm going to refer to it, is about jo Josh Jackson. who went to actually Kansas. Now, his mother apparently received $2,700. Josh Jackson was approached about this during an interview and said, I have no idea about this, but I'll check into it. So here's my question is, you know, it went to his mother apparently. So did his mother actually receive this money or not? And was it $2,700? And are these guys already hiding because they're afraid of an FBI coming to their house and knocking on their door saying, hey, we need an interview because we need to see what the heck happened and how the heck did you end up at Kansas? So I think I think the problem is too that these player these kids are being forced to go somewhere and it's not their choice. And because of all these deals and our money and it's the FBI in the FBI's hands now. So and I think Yahoo's already come under fire for the political things they have now leaked. Now they're leaking NCA. So I want to see what happens at Yahoo. But uh, too because they should be leaking FBI documents. That's not – that's usually not customary to leak FBI documents. It's a news story, but you don't leak that stuff. So that's why I'm beginning to think, is this stuff all true or not? But we'll wait for the FBI to come out and say everything. So, I've seen a couple of mixed articles where people were trying to discredit it, saying that everyone does it. And uh, the NCAA, their response is pitiful. Because they came out and they said that, uh, oh, it's up to the school. It's up to the school and whoever to punish them. And it's a systematic issue. It's not a systematic issue if it's the same repeat schools 
that are offenders. North Carolina's on here again. Louisville's on here again. Schools that have, have already had investigations in them for decades. So it's not a systematic issue whenever not all of the schools are involved. You have the same exact schools over and over again signing big name recruits. But they can't do anything because these are the schools that they think bring in the viewers and the money. And the NCAA, they only get money. Well, we've said it before. They only get money from basketball. They don't get it from football. The football schools don't split their money with the NCAA. So that, that's why they're never really going to go after a Duke, a North Carolina, these schools that suck at football. Because they can't. Because they're not... Okay, so North Carolina, Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, all awful at football. Will they ever win their conference of football? Highly unlikely. Will the NCAA ever punish them? Highly unlikely. Because they're going to keep getting money uh, from these schools in the form of the basketball tournament. And that's the fact. That's the corruption it is right here. LeBron James came out and said it. LeBron James has said in the past that he would have went to Ohio State. Who would, who would get hammered? Ohio State would. Why? Because they get a big chunk of money from football. And the NCAA is probably jealous about that, so they've come after Ohio State in the past. They've come after Miami's. They've came after, they just came after Notre Dame. They've come after Florida State. They come after Michigan. They come after all the big football schools, USC, uh, Texas. Who don't they come after? Those schools that suck at football. I mean, it's very easy to see. Anyone can see it. Uh, Matt, you had to make that correlation before that why, why is Florida State getting singled out here? Why, why are they coming after Clemson's? Why aren't they coming after the Dukes, the North Carolinas, the Kentuckys? The ones that Dickie V would scream about. And right there, that's why you have it. So LeBron James has said he would have went to Ohio State. Ohio State was in the national championship around the time he would have been there. That was the Greg, the Greg Odom years. So would he have been able to get them a national championship? Probably. Uh, but why would he want that? Um, because then you have the weight. Uh, everything goes on the school. They get pinged with some investigation because Nike's given him his own shoe. And whenever he's in high school... And it, they vacate Ohio State wins. It's just extra stress on him. Let him go directly to the NBA. He doesn't have to play in this. I saw Kevin Durant come out and said that he would have jumped. He went to Texas. Texas isn't known for being uh, a top-tier basketball school. But he went there, and he loved it. And he said if he had to do it again, he wouldn't go there just because he wanted to go directly to the NBA. And at least he's honest. So then you have some of these other guys. I remember the Josh Jackson recruitment because he's from Michigan and all of a sudden he was down uh, I believe between Michigan Michigan State I think he was a Michigan State lean I could be wrong then out of the blue Kansas comes in so am I surprised that he's on this list no because why would you be down between a couple schools and then all of a sudden leave and go to somewhere totally different it's not it's not the basketball pedigree he had to have been paid I mean, it, well, the FBI has proof now. The FBI is not going to lie about his family getting money because they're going after it for tax evasion, the same thing that brought down Al Capone. So when Sean Miller comes out and says his name will be cleared, most likely his name won't be cleared. If there's a wiretap for a hundred grand uh, tax at 25 percent, that's 25 grand uh, that the FBI should uh, be getting paid, probably half an Asian salary or whatever. Just for one year. How many guys, other guys have been paid? You could probably pay at least five to ten agent salaries just on Sean Miller's deals uh, for top recruits alone. Because he signed a couple top recruiting classes in a row. So I'm actually going to love it whenever they bring down these guys. And then finally, maybe the football schools will step up and say, you know what, NCAA, get away, get away from us. I, I, the ho I was hoping Notre Dame would do something, but they really haven't done anything after they got their wins vacated. They're probably sitting back. I think one of their guys was named in this. But, I mean, I don't know how far it goes. It's just embarrassing because you're bringing down the entire NCAA. And a lot of people lump football into it. And football shouldn't be lumped into this. Because I've seen some people try to make that connection between this, what happened with this, and Reggie Bush and his Heisman. But these are totally different things. Shoe companies don't run football. This is only basketball. And it needs to end. And they won't do anything. So but here's I, the other part. I really of this, don't know Rich. what's going to happen. Go ahead, Matt. When you look at that SMU documentary that ESPN ran, 
it, it shows – I mean that was a clear example with those players from that – that time period, you know, with with Eric Dickerson and Craig James and those guys, all those players were like, oh, yeah, we were all approached. We were all offered different things. And it was like just so nonchalant with, yeah, that's just how it, it happens. It has to happen at almost every level. As long as you're, you're an alumnus of a big program, of a big college Division One program, I think you're going to see that happen, especially if you, go, if you come from money and you have that extra income to, that you're willing to throw to keep your team as, as a top contender or if they've never been a contender, to make them a, con, a competitive, reputable team. I mean, you look at like the, how Baylor had fallen off the map and then – all of a sudden, they they bring in Bryles and they start they start rattling off these wins. You know, it, it's going to make people want to throw money at that program. And I think like yes, the shoe companies may have had an interest in the basketball end of it, but don't say that it's isolated when it there it has to run deeper. I mean, to me, the bigger thing with that is so they put the rule in saying stay one year of college. How much? have these players progressed in that one year that they were on a college campus? Well, what was that, the, the gain or the benefit of them spending that year in a school other than they had one extra year of being on a college campus and saying that, that they passed some classes that, you know, at UNC, they were just handing out, you know, degrees or handing out grades and courses. So, I mean, they really weren't even getting anything out of it that they were supposed to be in the first place. Yeah, I agree. They shouldn't – like, what's the point of them even being there? I think they should just allow all sports to forego, and that goes for football too. If you think you're good enough to go directly from football to the NFL now that they have this developmental league that Johnny Manziel is the face of for some reason, uh, let it happen because you know that they're not going to be ready. How many five-stars flame out? I can send you a list of five-stars at Michigan, and you can, it's a basically a who's who of who are these guys. Um, I, I, I mean – you're looking at it, yeah, you're right, Matt. Uh, it probably does happen everywhere. But I think in basketball, it's more concentrated because the AAU circuit. If you want to be a big-time recruit, you have to play ball uh, in AAU. And who's going to get the shoe deal money? The coaches of the AAU. It doesn't go directly to the players. Uh, you might have, and I think what's interesting is these documents are showing how these big companies get around from it. They kind of give it as a, a pre um, loan. They're like, hey, you know, if, if you come here, I can get you a scholarship at whatever school. Nike can say, here's a list of Nike schools. If for football, basketball, doesn't matter. Go to one of these. If you, if you get drafted in the NFL, we're going to sign you for this amount. Boom. Done deal for football. I mean, that's really how they can do it today because with cell phones and everything else, uh, it's going to be getting harder and harder to do it. But the easy way to do it is just a back deal, door handshake. Maybe offer uh, some of their family members jobs in the area. A lot of like these boosters now own small businesses. So you give your uncle, your brother, whatever, a job in the town so they can come watch their brother play. It's game over. But the AAU makes it so much easier because they have a middleman. Like the bag man is the AAU coach. It can be the shadiest of the shady guy who just doesn't even have a kid on the team, never had a kid. Maybe he never even played basketball, but he's the AAU coach, and he's he's picking and choosing which kids he wants on his team, and then Nike's going to go ahead and pay for their uniforms and give this coach extra money, and he's able to just kind of funnel it to the kids then because he's like, hey, uh, I'm going to pay. You guys want to go out to whatever? Here's a bunch of cash. I'll pay for it. I've seen it happen. If you go to an AAU tournament, uh, I went to one in Myrtle Beach a few years ago. The teams are out. They're out hanging out at the beach. They're going out all night, whatever they want to do. And who's paying for it? Coach. I mean, it's basically an impermissible benefit. And it's all sanctioned right there because they let it grow into this beast. And so I, I don't think it's going to end. I hope it keeps coming. Keep bringing them. I love it. It makes me laugh. And I, I hope it I hope it totally uh, destroys this basketball tournament when everyone has to talk about it the entire time. So I hope they, they save them up. I don't want them to release it before selection Sunday. I want them to leak them while the games are being played because I definitely think they have more, uh, but that's my final piece. You guys have anything else you want to add? Uh, Rick? Yeah, I have one point. I, uh, I looked up because I don't like, Oh, um, the dad ball 
I never liked the guy. I think he's very arrogant. And I looked up, I'm like, how does he make his money? I was wondering, I'm like, this guy doesn't have a real job. He's not a full-time guy. Then I looked it up. He's an AAU coach. I'm like, what the heck? And then I started doing research, Rich, exactly what you were saying. He makes money. He does this, does that. That's how he makes his money is through an AAU coach. I'm like, this is ridiculous. It actually, it, it's like a minor leagues without the payments to the players. You know, this is a minor league baseball where you're playing in some rinky dink town of like 20,000. I mean, this is pretty much tournament basketball where these guys are recruiting and everything else. It's, it's crazy about basketball. I don't understand it and I don't think I ever will, but uh, it's absolutely crazy. And I mean, there are so many flame outs and I don't understand, but it's all about money. And I know the right now, I know they always say the NCAA tournament for basketball makes so much money with ticket sales and blah, 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 and all this time and everything and how many people are doing brackets and how many people are undefeated after day one and everything. But, yeah, and the second thing is I have vacation out in Arizona. Sean Miller was on the hot seat for a long time. They wanted to fire him because he wasn't getting it done. And then all of a sudden they were doing this story about two years later about how great Sean Miller was a coach. And I let her look over my dad and I'm like, didn't they want to crucify this guy and pretty much throw him in the trash like two years ago and could never figure it out. Then I'm like, wait a second, how are they getting all these top like recruits? Like I couldn't figure that out. Then all this story pops out. It's, it's fascinating to watch all this and watch it unfold because of just the pure craziness. And it's all about money. It's all about fame. And is it worth it in the end to get your school trashed and you trashed? I'll add on to your point, Rick. Uh, before I forget, uh, I, I said Wichita State should claim the national championship for 2013. Uh, they shouldn't because they're actually named on this list for Fred Van Fleet or whatever that guy's name was. Uh, so Michigan 2013 national champions, you have it because Duke was also named. Uh, so, uh, uh, But going to your point against Ball, basically here's how it works. If you're an AAU coach and you have a five-star uh, athlete coming up through your team, he did, he has a couple sons, he is basically taking bids from three companies, Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour. They're all bidding against each other, and they want to pay for the rights to, to sponsor his team. So they're going to give him fifty to $100,000, possibly even more, for his son to wear Nike or whatever on his AAU team. And then once he does, then they can be like, hey, remember when we helped you out? Uh, maybe you should go to, and maybe I guess he was signed with Adidas. That's who UCLA is. So I would assume Adidas pays him. He says, uh, whatever goes through. Then Ball gets the idea like, hey, maybe I should start my own shoe company, Big Baller brand, and try to do the same, same thing because I have, now he's getting the big money. His son's going to UCLA. So every big time athlete in that area is going to want to play for his team. And then he has a chance to go ahead and create his own shoe company or whatever he wants to do. And for some reason, uh, sports uh, shows always have him on. So uh, basically, he's winning. He's winning. Matt, you have anything to add? Different angle to look at this, but no one raises an eyebrow about Major League Baseball kids signing out of high school. No one makes a big deal out of kids signing directly out of high school to play hockey. Why are we making such a big deal out of NBA players and forcing them to have to go to college? I, I, I never really thought about this until we were doing, I was doing some research for tonight. But when you look at these kids that can sign out of high school to play, you know, it's not, it's not an issue with any other sport. Why make it a big deal with the NBA? Let them go. It's because of the NCAA money. I, that's what it is. Huh? And uh, my final point, I'll let you guys end it, end of the show. Uh, the Big Ten tournament, I think, is this week in basketball. So yes. it, it'll be a kickoff. It, it's starting a week early for some reason uh, because they're trying to get that New York money. Uh, Delaney came out and said that it, it's a mistake, although he hopes to be back out in the East again, uh, that going early. But it'll, it'll be something that we'll see. Will playing this week, getting an extra, extra week's rest before the big tournament help? Or will all the Big Ten teams come in rusty and be eliminated that first weekend? First weekend or two. Um, we'll see. Because it's the first conference that's really ever done this. And this will be a good thing. I hope some more documents leak. Uh, the NCAA also... So 
they had Miles Bridges named in this document for getting a dinner paid for. He actually went and gave money back. I don't know who he gave money to. So the NCAA would clear him because the NCAA doesn't want any big names sitting out. That's why they said, leave it up to the school. So Michigan State said, oh, you're, you're listed for taking $40. If you pay us $40 back, then we'll say you're cleared to play. They tell the NCAA, well, we got 40 bucks from them, so we're going to call it even. Case closed. Everyone's celebrating. But it's not because it's not the NCAA. The FBI is looking into this. So we'll see. But that's my end for the show. Uh, you guys have any other closing topics you want to talk about? We'll start with you, Matt. Yeah, I was looking and I saw Five Star Hearts is looking into going to Tuscaloosa. So you could see Butch Jones rolling tide here pretty soon. Butch Jones, have at it. That's usually what happens to big names coaches that flame out in the SEC. They go work for for Daddy Nick. Uh, Rick, you have anything this week? Uh, Penguins lost today three two to the Devils, so that kind of stinks that way. So. Still in the playoff hunt, still everything good. So, But uh, Matt Hunwick, the guy who was rumored they wanted to get rid of, now has points in four out of his last five games. So guess he was worth keeping around. So instead of dumping him or making him the healthy scratch every night. So, I mean, um, still good there and everything. So I'm done. All right. That's our show for the week. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes. Uh, Google Play, Stitcher. I think we're on a bunch of different places. Follow us on social media, Southbound Sports and Sbound Sports on Twitter. And we'll see you guys next week.